Welcome to Crimson Guitars and welcome to... <laughs> Hi, how are you? Uh, microphone's on, camera's on. I'm here. I have decided that the last guitar that I built under a time limit was not enough. I'm going to try and build a custom guitar in nine hours. Uh, it is half past ten right now. Uh, it's half past ten. in the morning and it's chaos I'm gonna set a stopwatch and uh, get going in a minute I've had one of those mornings already basically the plan is I'm gonna try and build a guitar start to finish completely wired up playable even basically set up so that I can play without fret buzz and stuff like that I'm not going to let Sean talk me into a custom inlay this time. I, I, I might just talk myself into a custom inlay this time. Uh, there's no top. The body is a one-piece body, and uh, well, it's all good. The, the really cool thing about this is uh, this time we are going to be selling the guitar. Uh, we, so this is going to be available to buy. I am also going to build a second guitar instead of in nine hours I'm going to do the exact same guitar in 90 hours uh, and that one we're not going to film in real time uh, I have two pieces of this stunning quilted sapini it's a uh, pommel sapini I suppose is what you call it and uh, I also have enough to make two necks uh, out of it here yeah. and uh, a fantastic set of book matched Kingwood fretboards so the point of this is that we're going to build I can build a guitar in nine hours I can build I think I think we'll see um, and towards the end of the last build, I started flaking out and it went, went, went a bit bad, but hey. Um, if you haven't watched the 12-hour build, please do. Um, I think I, I'm pretty sure that I can do this. However, uh, spending 90 hours or 100 hours or 200 hours on a custom master-built guitar gives you a different result. And uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to... Uh, to show both of these. So one nine hour build, one 90 hour build, essentially the same guitar with the same hardware, the same pickups, etc. but a huge difference in time. Okay, well that was a three minute intro and I really shouldn't have started that. I should have done the intro before the clock hit 10.30. Uh, so anyway, I'm sure that I don't know. Anyway, hi. Um, stopwatch. Start. Doesn't want to start. Start. Reset. Start. Oh, I'm sorry, we can't do it today. No, that's a, that's a timer. Stopwatch. Ah! We're building a guitar. So, so there we go. Um, there we go. Hi. Okay. Essentially, I have to start, I have to start with the neck and uh, this is going to be, this is going to be fun. Now what I'm going to be building is a PAF One of the Crimson Guitars PAS. I need to get out of talking mode. Which is funny because that means that I'm going to do a voiceover now. So, 
It is true, I really should have pre-planed the edge of this timber beforehand, because that technically wouldn't be cheating, I think. Uh, put it through the plane of thickness, sir. Eh? But, uh, well, in the interest of veracity, here we are. What I might end up doing is, uh, I'm not going to talk, I'm not going to teach, this isn't a tutorial. Um, that's one of the things that uh, got me last time, actually. I don't believe you. However... However what? I will uh, possibly... Possibly what? Possibly record a little bit of voiceover. I don't believe you. As we go. This is strange. This is weird. The plan is that uh, instead of routing the truss rod axis and the carbon fibre, while the neck is in the actual shape of neck, I'm going to use the straight edge that I've just planed on the edge of the uh, timber. How many times did I say the word edge there? And uh, I'm going to use a guide to... Uh, a fence, sorry, as a guide for the router. Nut line, also supremely important when you're building an instrument. <laughs> Almost the most important part of it, to be honest. This is going to be so beautiful. The head of the truss rod is significantly wider and a little bit deeper uh, than the shaft, which uh, actually caused me some trouble later because I wasn't expecting that. Uh, the deeper bit, at least. Look at the man, deep in thought. Downstairs. Oh, coffee. And distracted. That's a Monty's Guitars mug. They make fantastic pickups. <laughs> As was evidenced by the uh, unboxing video in the last. Carbon fibre. It's so weird having to stop talking to listen to myself talk. Nope. I don't know what I'm doing. How's it going? The stairs killed my microphone. So, through the uh, as ever hectic production studio, there's Luthia Tom. Everybody must wear headphones. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit dizzy. Too much moving around. So this, uh, this workshop, which I suppose it's the factory floor really, is in the middle of being completely rejigged and rebuilt 
predominantly from a dust control point of view. We've got uh, many, many things going on, but uh, it must be said, do not uh, use this as a basis from which to design your workshop as yet. Uh, all will change. Trick number one, buy good quality clamps, unlike this one. Even at this stage, that timber is looking so stunning. Unlike the Luthier, who simply looks stunned. After a few years in this game, you'd be surprised how many random bits of kit uh, one acquires. Drill bits and router cutters and... and crappy, crappy clamps. So here we go. This is my faithful old trend, I think T20 maybe, router. And uh, it uh, many years ago lost the dust extraction ports and all of that, which I suppose makes it uh, not really fit for purpose nowadays. But the fence works perfectly well. The depth stop works amazingly. So here we are. I line the router cutter up on the center line and the camera gets in our way. Now always, always check this, seriously. Measure, measure, cut is something that uh, is said a lot, but uh, yeah, if you don't you, you will often end up crying. So, put the router cutter straight down onto the wood, as hard as it will go, and uh, set the depth from there. That's uh, Tom, our head toolmaker, and Daniel, currently making a uh, an heirloom rocky neck rest. And here we go. Oh, and there he goes. So, center line, nut line, truss rod, and we're away. Through all of that fiddling, I had the power off. At the wall, at least. Now, take the cuts in smaller passes, 2 mil, 3 mil at worst. And concentrate. I never trust the measurements, I always check it with a, a ruler or a caliper and then actually try and fit the truss rod in place. This was a little bit naughty and all the while I'm doing it I'm thinking, hmm, I probably should have waited until the cutter stopped before loosening off those uh, locking nuts, but, uh, but nobody's going to notice and then of course I do a voiceover and I mention it. So yeah, that's just a fail really. So what I'm doing here is moving the fence off center just for that slightly larger nut on the truss rod. What I hadn't realized but, uh, was that I needed to uh, 
make it deeper as well. So, yeah, that's naughty. Really. Wait till the router cut is stopped. There we go. Good boy. So we have Tom setting up a vacuum bag on a drop top custom Burl Elm descendant. There's Daniel still using the spindle sander. Oh, you didn't get to focus on that. That's a four mil uh, little router cut. Yep, yep. Focus, just, you, just not fast enough. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a four mil router cutter with a yeah, quarter inch shaft, 6.35 mil. This router has been with me for well over a decade and uh, it's used almost exclusively now for truss rod channels. There we go. I thought we could get some focus on. But uh, yeah, it's a fantastic router. Trains really do know what they're doing. The scariest thing at this point is uh, if your router cutter isn't properly tightened and it starts going deeper than you want, you, you run the risk of uh, completely messing up your neck entirely. And that's not a good idea. So out comes the pencil again. I think we should play a game. Every single time one of these pencils comes out of my pocket, uh, you have a drink or, I don't know, make a shaving or something. So there you can see a little bit of chip away where the router cutter was coming in in the wrong direction. I'll get that later with a chisel. So, now we are using some carbon fibre rods to stiffen this neck. It's the first time I've ever actually done it, ever in 150 plus guitars. Uh, the reason, however, is that uh, the quilting isn't necessarily giving us the strongest timber. Triple check. Uh, it's very, very pretty, but uh, not necessarily string, str strong enough. Excuse my... I can't speak anymore. Uh, but it is also not quarter sawn, and as a one-piece neck, I was concerned about that. So, uh, so it seems to be a good time to put a carbon fibre rod in. Now, setting the depth, I thought it might be a good idea to put the rod in. <laughs> there we go. So, uh, turned out it wasn't quite deep enough in the end, but uh, there we go. One thing I realised was that my rod was actually longer than the neck should be, but uh, I'll cut that down later. Remember, not very deep, especially with a 4 mil cutter. Uh, the, the, the trick is to take small passes slowly. Luigi would kill me if I'd broken his cutter. There's James in the background giving somebody the tour. A client who's just come to uh, pick up a guitar and also take some photographs of us, which you should see later. 
a distraction, but a welcome one. So here we see I had uh, gone to the bottom of the depth stop, but it wasn't quite enough. I wanted just a little bit more play. So one last pass. There we go. So I'm just looking right at the end of the rod to see that it fits. Now I need to change the position of the cutter to the next carbon fibre rod and we're away. And we're done with the router for now. Or not. So this is a bullnose cutter. And with it I'm going to quickly route the truss rod access cavity. This is, this is an argument for creating necks out of a, a lovely rectangular blank. It does make this job easier. Uh, often at Crimson Guitars we will try and save wood and use the smallest blank possible and uh, have it pre-angled, etc. Uh, which, uh, yeah, it does make this slightly more difficult. We have templates that we use uh, to hold the jig centred. For, uh, for the truss rod access and for the uh, for the truss rod itself. I just got my pencil out again, didn't I? Double check that it all lines up, set the depth stop. I tend to go about 14 mil deep with this. Bear in mind we're going to angle the headstock down. Oh, you've got to go again. There was a little burn mark there that I didn't really like. There we go. And it made another burn mark. Well, what can you do? So there we go. The beginning of a neck. 20 odd minutes into the build. At this point, if I'd realised that the truss rod nut was deeper, I could have got the router out again and uh, routed that a little bit better and saved a few minutes uh, messing around later with the chisel. But uh, I'm going to blame the stress and, and be done with it. That looked like a decision was made there. Hmm, 
So, there's Daniel making uh, alien grade rocking neck rests out of off cuts uh, from this fantastic quilted sapele. Extraction on. Now, watch, I'm about to make a mistake. Always set the uh, depth so that your fingers cannot get in between the wood and the blade. Here I am thinking, thinking hard. And uh, I'm sure I've forgotten something, but I can't quite... See, there we go again. Can't quite figure out what it is I've forgotten. And he makes the cut anyway. Oh, no. Hmm. Confusion. Oh, oh. Hello, Tom. <laughs> So, uh, what actually happened there is uh, the switch on this old bandsaw has uh, decided it wants to give up the ghost. There we go. So, uh, I'm going to replace that switch one day. Now, what I had actually planned is even further from my mind now at this point. But around about here, around about here, I realise. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Now, I had planned on making the back plates in the same way uh, in which we make that was a bad sentence the back plates for all of the rest of our instruments uh, in a, a matching timber that matches the neck uh, and in this case I thought well I've got a very thick neck blank I'll cut a veneer off five or six mil and use that but uh, by making two cuts in it already I've limited the space I have. It worked out in the end, but uh, I got the order slightly wrong. Now, here I'm using the fantastic uh, hammer bandsaw, and it's got a veneering blade on it, which uh, was basically brand new about a week before we filmed. However, somebody had... Oh, look at the fear on my face there. Somebody had used it very recently a lot on some sort of very waxy timber. So you can see it's cutting, it's very difficult. Uh, the, the teeth are basically all clogged up with wax. But uh, I'm too far in now to, uh, to do anything about that. I definitely don't have time to change the blade. An interesting thing about this wood is uh, it is sapili, which is generally very hard. There you can see the ceramic guide bushes. Uh, sapili is very, very hard and, and bright, especially in comparison to mahogany, or true mahogany at least. But this quilted or pomel sapili appears to be, it's much softer, much closer to what I would expect. Uh, a true mahogany to be, uh, which is uh, yeah, making this cut easier, although still a bit of a struggle. At this stage I'm starting to think about push sticks. The blade is, uh, there we go, not quite, it's going through so slowly that I need to have a better purchase on it than that stick afforded. Now you keep it square and push through and you're alright. Could have used a feather board here, but it was uh, 
pretty superfluous, to be honest. I love how quickly this blade stops. It's a really, really good machine. And there we go. A book matched piece of uh, quilted Sakuni. And now I can go back. Don't forget to adjust the bandsaw. You don't want your hands going underneath there. Every now and then, and this also happens with uh, inlay saws, jewelers saws and things. Every now and then the blade will catch in a soft piece of grain and will jump two or three centimeters or two or three inches at a time. And if your hand is in the way, you want it to be stopped by the, uh, by the machine itself, not by the blade. Extreme concentration here. I'm planning on routing this out later, and uh, I do despise router tables. Uh, you want to have it so that you take as little material off as humanly possible. And therefore you cut as close to the line as you can, which is scary in its own right. Looks like a tool handle to me. These big offcuts are going to go to the tool makers and they're going to make some extra special tools to go in our online store. Sadly the offcuts weren't big enough to make another guitar. So, I need to cut the angle on my headstock, and I should have done that before cutting the outline. Can you tell that we normally build guitars out of smaller stock? I haven't built one in this method for uh, five or six years now. Anyway, that's where, where the offcut works very well. Don't draw it on that side. That's the wrong side, Ben. Come on. There we go. So the headstock needs to be about 15 millimeters thick. That seems to be what most tuners are designed to, to fit. So we mark out. And uh, you'll notice I'm not using a protractor or anything like that. I know that with a you know, 38 to 40 mil blank, if I leave 15 mil thick, I will get an angle that's roughly between 10 and 13 degrees, which is, uh, which is all we need.
What the hell was that? Don't look up. Just, just don't do it. Templates are key to a build, especially when we're trying to be this, this quick. So I need to know where to carve a bit later. So on my neck pocket, on the neck cheek, I need to mark that out. Super glue and accelerator. If you haven't seen the super glue and masking tape trick, I think the video is titled The Greatest Luthiers Trick Ever. That's a Robert Fripp model. Oh, that's really nice. Should I have. Mm. Oh, that's nice, Tommy. Stop distracting me. So it appears I've doubled up on the super glue and masking tech. Now I needed the template to make sure that I knew exactly where my nut was. Just to be precise. Now, with this marking here, I know where the heel should extend to, roughly, because this is thicker than it's going to end up being. And uh, I can pack away rather a lot of excess material. Not including the fretboard, a neck ends up being around about 15 millimeters thick. 15 to 17 on average. I'm playing it safe here. That's a creditable straight edge. So double check the, or at least mark out the thickness of the headstock now. Which bands are? Don't forget the extractor. There we go. Now the headstock is not supported, I could or probably should have taped a bit of uh, offcut to that as well. But as it stands, holding the other end flat, this worked out rather well. 
even with the blunt blade. Incidentally, oven cleaner is very, very good at getting that resin off blades. Now here is where Ben Crow, Master Luthier, forgets that one cannot really turn a corner with an inch wide blade. Deep. Wide or deep. You know what I mean. And I'm starting to think, what the hell is wrong? Why isn't this working properly? Oh, there we go. So you have to pull out and uh, go again at a slightly steeper angle from further back. If you look carefully you can see some sparks, which are also quite scary. Let's attack it from the bottom. I'm also trying to save as much timber as possible. It's just too beautiful to, uh, to put in the bin. There we go. Got a load more coming. Yeah. Tom. Tom, who I've just been talking to, is our uh, head lu head luthier. No, he's not. Not the slightest. Head toolmaker. I was just giving him some offcuts. We are going to create a load of Comel Sapili tools out of the offcuts from this build, and. Uh, those will be uh, up soon too. <laughs> this guy really, really does appear to be enjoying himself rather too much. I need to think this through a little bit more. I better stop walking around. Tanya, no? could you take this upstairs for me, please? You're wonderful, thank you. We're not quite finished outside, which is typical. Back on with the PPE <sighs> and into the noise. And this is where the super glue and the accelerator comes to bear. And the much vaunted and very, very worth it masking tape and super glue trick. What do you want? Let's try it.
this is something you will see a lot through this build. You burnish the tape down to make sure it doesn't uh, come off too easily. Uh, I have a fantastic burnisher upstairs that uh, BC Woodworks made me, but uh, in a pinch the bottom of the super glue bottle will work. You also need to make sure that you don't obscure your center lines. You need to know where to actually put the uh, template down when it comes down to it. So we're using the new Crimson Multi super glue. It's a, a medium viscosity and uh, we've managed to keep the price down really well on that. Accelerator because hey it's fast. Nasty 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 stuff to breathe in but Now this does away with about 10 or 15 minutes of messing around with uh, double-sided tape. You can never take double-sided tape off easily. Whereas the uh, Marcy Tape and Super Glue trick is almost always very easy to take off. Except when one is building a guitar in nine hours. So this is a four flute radian cutter. Somebody's taken the normal bearing off and put a smaller one on the top. I'm assuming to do some binding or something. I'm going to have to change that later in this video. And uh, the Triton router table. This is their new and improved. The router table is where Triton routers really come to the fore. It's easy, easy adjustment. As long as you don't forget to take the lock off. and you pull the uh, cutter all the way up and it automatically locks off. So you can, uh, well there's no fiddling around. Many other router tables you have to take the router all the way out um, or take inserts out etc. This just pops the collet all the way out the top and uh, I really am rather in love with it. Off to get a quarter inch collet, no half inch collet. There we go. So the other thing is you're not able to raise the route a bit enough to lock the spindle off without turning the router itself off. So I have to turn that back on again and turn the and also lock lock it off so it doesn't move. But it's uh, hooked up to a little extractor for dust extraction obviously. Now I want that fence there just in case I need to lean against it as I go. Gives you a little bit more support. I really, really, really do not like using router tables. They scare me. This, however, as router tables go, is rather stunning. It's more the fact that uh, everything's backwards. I just want to make sure that there's no masking tape getting in the way and changing the shape. Uh, as I go around the template. I do need to sharpen that knife. It must be said. Double check that the hose is installed. People tend to uh, clean off the uh, Oh, he's, he's putting it in the wrong hole. Come on, Ben. People take the hose out, clean off the top of the router table, and then forget to put the hose back in. So that's the router plugged into the extractor, which has an automatic on-off. 
And uh, both machines are going now. Keep your fingers away from the fast spinning blades. Take the smallest cut possible. Double check everything's working well. And then move the camera person out your way. Now, I've seen far too many necks put in the bin as a result of messing up on the router table. And uh, I have decided, judiciously, that I would rather spend a few more minutes on the headstock using a spindle sander to get the shape right than on the router table. Because that would, uh, that would make me cry at this point, it must be said. So, small cuts, small intelligent cuts, while keeping your fingers out of the way. When in doubt, always keep your fingers further away than uh, you think is safe. At this point I was worried about the router cutter grabbing the end grain and, uh, and pulling the neck into it. So I've got a really, really hard grip with my left hand and the push stick is pushing through. Time for the camera people to change over. One hour already. And there we go. Thanks for watching episode one.